Hello and welcome. My name is Carlos Boudet. I'm a general dentist in West Palm Beach, Florida, and I want to welcome you to this introductory course on smile design and minimal preparation porcelain veneers. The course is about an hour long and I have divided it into three parts. This is the first part and here I will be talking about smile design principles. I will present a fairly detailed guide of the procedural steps in the diagnosis and treatment planning of a simple case of porcelain veneers and the smile design principles that are taken into consideration. At the end of this course, the participants will be able to do the following. Recognize the characteristics of simple veneer cases. Understand the basic principles of smile design. Apply the smile design principles to a simple veneer case. And recognize the procedural steps as we follow a case start to finish. I will try not to bore you with a lot of basic information, but a good starting point is the classification of veneers. Uh, veneers can be classified by the materials that they are made of, such as composite or porcelain, the method of fabrication, direct or indirect, and the degree of preparation required, with the three levels described as no prep veneers, minimal prep veneers, and full prep veneers. Now today I will not talk about composite veneers and the direct method. Specifically, I will talk about the minimal preparation veneers, but first let's go over the basic differences between the three levels of preparation. No prep veneers are heavily advertised for their appeal to the public since nobody likes to have their teeth drilled or reduced for dental work. So there's very little reduction of tooth structure. You may round off sharp corners or line angles, but basically very little preparation. The bond strength is excellent since you're bonding to enamel. This limits the amounts of things that you can do with the veneers, such as correcting moderate to severe crowding. You are unable to properly mask very dark or discolored teeth. It may be difficult to hide all the margins and the margins can be a little bulkier. These cases are usually done without temporization, making the case easier and less time consuming. And finally, these cases work out well when they have been treatment planned properly and for selected cases such as short teeth with spaces in between them. Minimal prep veneers require some tooth reduction from zero to half a millimeter with an average of about three tenths of a millimeter. This allows you to define margins for better veneer adaptation and less bulky margins than no prep veneers. The bond is still mostly to enamel but there may be some dentin exposed, so they usually require temporization. Since you are allowed some tooth reduction, you're better able to correct moderate amounts of crowding and mask darker tooth colors. I should say that you can also select a slightly more opaque porcelain and you may be able to lighten the darker shades but this way you will lose some of the natural translucency that is so desirable in anterior aesthetic cases. And finally we come to full prep veneers. Full prep veneers require a reduction of tooth structure of a, about a half a millimeter and more, which means that you may be bonding mostly to a dentinal surface you will be able to correct many crowding and tooth alignment problems and get the best margins due to the greater amount of reduction possible at the margins. You also need to fabricate good temporaries to avoid sensitivity and the greater amount of reduction allows you to mask dark teeth adequately. 
Now, spending some time treatment planning your veneer case will make the difference between a great looking case and one that does not look so great. We begin the treatment planning process with obtaining a health history, a radiographic survey. In my practice, this means a panoramic radiograph, four bite wings, and if needed, some periapical films. Spending some time taking the necessary photographs. These are very important, not only for treatment planning, but also for documentation purposes. Study models mounted in centric relation. Recording the initial shade of the teeth early in the treatment planning is also necessary since, since wider teeth are one of the most common requests the patients make. The patient's chief complaint in detail is also very important since if it's not addressed the case may look good but it might be a disappointment for the patient. So after we have taken all the necessary records we are ready to start evaluation, evaluating the case. We have the medical history review that helps us determine if there are any concerns that might require some care or modification of treatment, such as allergies, latex sensitivity, etc. Now I look at functional considerations, such as wear patterns that would indicate parafunctional habits, such as clenching or grinding, a temporomandibular dysfunction, a severely deep or overclosed bite, cross bites, class 3 jaw relationships, etc. The more functional problems that I find, the less likely that a case will be a simple one. After I have determined all the functional details, I will look at the cosmetic aspects of the case. And to help me assess these, we have guidelines that are very helpful in determining the beauty level, if you will, of the case. These guidelines are called Smile Design Principles. Even though these guidelines should help us create a beautiful smile, we must not forget to take into account the patient's expectations. Normally, they are reasonable, but occasionally you will find a patient with unreasonable expectations. Okay, so what are these smile design principles? I'll go quickly over the list and then describe each one of them. The first one is central dominance, golden proportion, symmetry, axial inclination, smile line, gingival line, gingival display, tooth shape, smiled with, incisal embrasures, and interproximal contacts. There may be other guidelines, but I think these are the most important ones. First, we'll talk about central dominance. This is the most important guideline, and it should be addressed first. Central dominance is the concept that the maxillary central incisors are the most important factor in creating a beautiful smile. The centrals must have the right proportions of length and width. Their position must take into account the midline, especially the horizontal plane, the amount of tooth showing at rest, the incisal edge shape, the embrasures, etc. Once you set up the central incisors with these parameters, the rest becomes easier. Golden Proportion. The Golden Proportion is a rule that can be used to help determine the size, shape, and arrangement of the teeth in the anterior region when compared to the central in the form of a ratio. This ratio relates to the visible width of the anteriors when the patient smiles. The Golden Proportion ratio is 1.6 to 1 to 0.6. This means that the central's width has a value of 
1.6 in the ratio. In the ratio, the lateral's width is visibly narrower and has a value of 1. And the canine has a perceived width that is even narrower with a value of 0.6. Another guideline that is related to the golden proportion and central dominance is the proportion of the width to the length of the central incisors and that is approximately 0.7 to 1. This means that if the central is 7 millimeters wide, then it should be 10 millimeters long. Symmetry. Symmetry is important in order to create an aesthetically pleasing smile. The teeth basically need to appear as symmetrical as possible with respect to the midline of the face. You also want to be symmetrical or parallel to the interpupillary line. And if there is some asymmetry in the face, try to have the smile parallel to the horizontal plane. Axial inclination. The axial inclination of the anterior teeth is another factor that enhances the aesthetics of the smile design when it is done properly. The axial inclination should gradually increase as you go distally in the smile zone. If you picture in your mind an imaginary line from the root apex to the middle of the incisal edge, this line should tip slightly towards the distal, and the inclination is slightly more pronounced from central to lateral and from lateral to canine. If this inclination is in the wrong direction, it will make the smile less attractive. Smile line. The smile line is an imaginary line created by the incisal edges of the teeth when a person smiles. An ideal smile line should follow the curve of the top of the lower lip. When the incisal edges of the maxillary teeth follow the curve of the lower lip in a smile, this is very pleasing and desirable. Gingival line. The gingival line is another imaginary line created by the gingiva as it follows the neck of the teeth. This line should be even, with the level of the centrals and canines slightly higher than the laterals. When the gingival line is uneven, it results in an unesthetic smile. Here you can see how much the appearance of the teeth has improved after a small amount of laser crown lengthening and gingival recontouring was performed. I am sure you agree that even the best veneers wouldn't look very good if they were placed in a patient with an uneven gingival line. Gingival display. The amount of gingival tissue displayed when you smile is called gingival display. If the gingival display is excessive, this can result in a smile that is less pleasing very often called a gummy smile. Even if everything else looks great, showing a lot of gum tissue will detract from your smile. If it is determined that improvement is needed in this area, laser gingival recontouring, surgical crown lengthening, and lip reattachment procedures are procedures that are available to correct this kind of situation. Tooth shape. Tooth shape or form obviously influences the smile in many ways. For example, the tapered teeth in the upper left hand side of the screen are more likely to show dark triangles in older individuals than square teeth. Peg shaped teeth like the laterals in the lower left of the screen are not pleasing to the eye. 
Mammalons may be more acceptable in young individuals than older ones. Rounded incisal edges and line angles like those in the upper right picture may look great in young individuals but may not be appropriate for an older person. The square shaped teeth in the lower right might look better in a male than a female smile. The shape of the face, the age of the patient, and the gender will help guide the shape selection. Two factors that are related to tooth shape are the interproximal contact area and the incisal embrasures. Incisal embrasures. The incisal embrasures are formed by the corners of the incisal edges of the anteriors and should increase slightly from central to canine. Designing the teeth with adequate incisal embrasures can change the appearance of the teeth from looking old and worn where there are no incisal embrasures to looking young where the embrasures are pronounced and the incisal edge is not flat from wear. I tried to illustrate in this slide the incisal embrasures with an orange color and I'm afraid it may be hard to see. The arrow points to the incisal embrasures. Interproximal contacts. The interproximal contacts can also influence the shape of the teeth. When you have longer contacts, the teeth look more square, and shorter contacts make the teeth look more tapered. Even the position of the contacts in relation to the interproximal bone is important in creating optimal gingival contours, since it has been shown by the research done by Coith that the interproximal papilla does not fill the space predictably if the contact is more than 5 millimeters away from the interproximal bone. This slide shows teeth with a small contact close to the incisal edge that creates the dreaded dark triangle, even in the presence of good gingival health. Smile width and buccal corridors. The width of the smile is mostly determined by the arch form. A narrow, tapered arch will not allow you to see a pleasing progression as you go from the front to the back teeth, and will make the centrals more prominent and have a tendency to leave dark areas in the corners of the mouth. These buccal corridors, as they are commonly called, are filled by the canines and premolars in wide arch forms and can be improved in the narrow arch patient by designing the case appropriately. In this drawing of this handsome young couple, which was done in Las Vegas by a talented artist, I want to show you how the artist noticed the empty buccal corridors in the picture of the young man. The young lady was watching the artist paint everybody with a toothy smile, so when it was her turn to pose, she refused to show any teeth. This concludes the first part of our course. The second part will be posted soon and I will talk about assessing case difficulty levels and show a step-by-step -step demonstration on a model. Here's my contact information and thank you for watching.